and, and I'll be happy to take questions, and anything that I can't answer, I'll simply refer to Steve. <laughs> Bill. Uh, I know less about smart grid than you, but what kind of infrastructure we need for implementing a smart grid? Yeah, so we need lots more than what we've got now. Um, what I didn't talk about was there are a lot of different levels of smart grid. Right now, we are beginning to implement smart grid 1.0, and we're not very far along. Smart grid 1.0 is going to be smart meters on the uh, uh, with all the customers so that we know the way in which uh, energy is being used locally and can develop models for, for how that works so that uh, one can respond to changes in load. Smart Grid 2.0 is going to be the proliferation of really good sensors throughout the system and there's, and, and again, we don't have much of that in place either. We've got more smart uh, meters, we have less in the way of really good smart uh, sensors that's uh, a lot more implementation of that need, needs to be done. By the way, I should say that Europe is doing a lot better than the United States in the implementation of these kinds of things, and so we have a lot to learn there. In, in what my colleagues call Smart Grid 3.0, then we have the ability for the customers to sell back their electricity uh, to yeah. the grid, and while that's being done uh, a little bit sort of on a local level already, uh, that'll be done on a much more global level in, in uh, Smart Grid 3.0, which is more or less a dream for the moment. So, yeah. so the answer is we're not that far along, but we sort of know what needs to be done. I know that the IEEE has been always very important in energy and grids and everything. How, how, how are they now playing a role in this smart grid stuff? Yes, so as I understand it, uh, the IEEE is one of a number of professional agencies who are working on the creation of, uh, of standards for the performance of various uh, elements. These then represent, in a sense, voluntary industry-motivated standards as opposed to government-imposed standards. It's certainly the way that traditionally is favored in the United States, I'm not saying it's necessarily the best way, but it's the way that, that historically has been favored in the United States to, uh, to create standards is to have this thing be done in an industry-driven way. And then NIST doesn't impose standards, NIST tries to provide standards of measurement as opposed to impose standards of, of operation. And so we're trying to play a role in making sure that the kinds of standards that are uh, created uh, voluntarily by the industry are things that can be met by the kinds of measurements that need to be done. Uh, and the connection is like this, more or less? Could be? <laughs> well, okay, so that's a good question. How, is the, how are the connections done? In fact, my understanding is that a lot of the communication is indeed going to be done through the internet. Now, one of the big challenges there is how do you know what time it is at the sensor at the time when uh, you receive the thing on the internet? And that's something that NIST has been really good at. For good or ill, we have learned how to timestamp things like financial transactions so that everybody knows exactly when they traded a stock. Now, this may not be a good thing, but we've learned how to do it in a way that is um, uh, not only accurate but also reliable. Uh, so that people can't fake it. Now, I don't know why anybody would want to fake the data from the, uh, the smart grid, but if they want to, we've got it covered. So, so uh, apparently it can be done. Of course, you do have to worry about redundancy because the Internet isn't a completely reliable uh, operation, and there is some redundancy being built in, but I'm afraid I don't know too much about that. Uh, we are working on... Um we're working on uh, small smart grids in, say, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and um, uh, a major barrier is uh, the appropriate institutional arrangements uh, in order to be able to, to get it started. But some work well, some not so well. Uh, any experience of small and smart um, uh, 
where um, different uh, sources of energy at village level come together, so solar, wind, bio, and um, um, uh, sharing in, in the grid actually works, rather than big and smart. Yeah, well, um, so, so the, the simple answer is, I don't know that much about it. I believe that small and smart has to do with what we're calling microgrids, and uh, I think that in making those things work in themselves is less of a challenge than making a really big system work because you're working over smaller distances and you're also working with people who presumably have more of a buy-in to want to make it work as opposed to a wide range of systems. But maybe Steve has uh, a comment to make about that. Yeah, there are both. Uh, there are ones which are isolated, but there are also ones, there's a couple in Germany I know, that where they have, you know, bio, solar, everything storage, and tied to the grid. Uh, and, and, but it, it builds right, it's at the micro scale. And then there are the isolated ones which are far away from anything and that's all they have. And so those, those are working. Uh, one quick comment about the data. Uh, this data stream is humongous. We can't, we can't synchronize the PMUs that we have now. It's, it's really huge amounts of data. So there has to be hierarchies of how you do this. At the lowest few levels, the lowest one level, the post on down has to be autonomous, completely autonomous, because, you know, terabytes of data streaming, petabytes streaming back and forth yeah. uh, are, are impossible. And uh, it's going to get worse. Yeah, the, the, those <laughs> single phasers, there's 5,000 5, of them. They're time stamped, but it's all after the fact. Think of it, every 60, 60 times a second, you're getting phase and amplitude voltage. And, <laughs> and, and you need information on a much, yeah. much uh, faster time scale than 16 right. milliseconds yeah, so. uh, in order to know what's going on. So, <laughs> yeah. Bill, you mentioned phase as a major problem. Um, here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> phase is obviously becoming a major problem if timing issues matter. And for these large grids, they will yeah. matter. So is there a tendency to go back to DC grids? Ah. <laughs> and well, okay, so the answer also more is, energy efficient. Yeah, so I really don't know about DC grids. Obviously, that would be less of a problem. Uh, you'd a lot, uh, presumably, you would be able to um, uh, interface with with the, the kind of DC production you get from solar cells. I mean, now what you have to do is take the DC production from solar cells, you have to invert it into uh, to AC. One of the good things about that is, though, that you have um, uh, at least a certain degree of better control over what phase you want to deliver as opposed to when you have rotating machinery. Uh, but there's no question that DC has advantages in that uh, you're not going to have the same kind of losses. Uh, a lot of the losses from AC are to, to, to radiation induced uh, currents uh, in various places. Uh, and I, I, as I've just learned recently, I believe it was Steve who told me <laughs> that uh, because the AC has a higher peak voltage, then you have to worry more about corona. Uh, but again, maybe Steve would like to comment on DC. Yeah, um, there's been proposed DC backbones in the United States, for example, for a long time, um, over a decade. And um, there is no phase problem. If you have a backbone of DC and you, and you drop it there, and, and it's, it's perfect. Um, they, but there is no national, at least in the United States, central clearinghouse that makes a decision. So I think the first DC backbone is, is happening right now in China. In fact, I know it's happening in China. Uh, Europe is trying to get something going. I have a, a rather naive questions, but uh, who will define the rules on, on this smart grid? You, you're talking about uh, integrating, for instance, fluctuating energy. So who's going to decide that when the wind blows, you have to shut down some uh, coal-fired power plant somewhere? How, how is this going to be uh, regulated? Well, one thing I'm sure of, it's not going to be us who decide that. Um, so obviously this is, is, is something that's probably in the place like the United States is going to be done by some kind of a combination of an industry-driven uh, process 
probably with some kind of a central body overseeing it, and it'll probably be done very differently in other places, but it sounds like the sort of thing that's much more of a political decision than it is a uh, scientific one, and again, I'll defer to, to Steve. In, in the United States, it's done at the state level and below the state level, uh, and the states have renewable portfolio standards that say, you know, you know, uh, there's a certain fraction that has to, you try to make it come from those things. And so it, there again, we have no, we the United States has no central policy. We, we have no real energy policy. And, and <laughs> if, if you remember that map that showed the, the spread of, uh, of a disturbance in, in a matter of seconds off across the entire eastern part of the United States, you can see how difficult a problem it will be if you're deciding things on a state level. That was a, a disturbance that involved something on the order of 30 different states in a matter of seconds. So. <laughs> um, maybe a simple question, I'm not sure. Does this system being controlled through the internet increase the security risk of interference from third parties who want to take aggressive action against the national power supply? Yes. <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, obviously that's a whole other um, uh, issue about how to achieve cybersecurity and well, there are a lot of different approaches, and I'm not really competent to say what they are, but, uh, you know, the best way, of course, is to not use the Internet and to have, uh, have backups, but it's... Uh, <laughs> it looks like Steve wants to say something, so please. <laughs> it's, it's nearly impossible not to use the Internet. I, I think the oil and gas industry, and especially Middle East countries, they, they get their energy security and their infrastructure by having it completely isolated, sort of like the nuclear weapons labs. But, but for the Internet and coordinating this at the, at the, at the uh, you know, Western Connect, Eastern Connect, and ERCOT, you, you, it's almost nearly yeah. impossible. Yeah. It's so huge. It, yeah. And, and there's also physical security. So here's, it's known, it, we have in the United States what's called N minus one reliability. We try to achieve N minus one, which means if you get one substation out, the system is robust enough to survive. We do not have N minus two. All you need is a terrorist to attack out two uh, substations. Uh, you don't have to be that bright to figure out which ones and you bring the system down. And so just, shooting, just, so just shooting a few bullets through the transformers of substations, which was done in California the same day as the Boston Marathon, so it didn't get that much press. The Boston Marathon bombing, uh, they brought down a major substation by shooting rifle bullets through the transformer, the oil leaked out, it overheated. And if so, so you just have to do this with two, and to guarantee a major catastrophe, you just do three. And this idea that, that you can just shoot a substation, which, you know, I, I, I just recently learned about this from talking to my colleagues, that this is one of the things that people have done, is shoot bullets into the transformers, and it's just what Steve said. The failure was not because of the damage to the, that the bullets made, it was the fact that the oil leaked out. And this is one of the things that more advanced sensors will help with a little bit, because in that case, you didn't know until the thing heated up so much that, uh, that, it, it, that it went down that there was a problem, and more advanced sensors will be able to tell about that earlier, which is going to help a little bit. Um, so, so maybe it's maybe it's just a it's a greater increase of remote attack rather than physically closer attack, because both are vulnerable. Both systems are vulnerable. Well, yeah, both things are going to happen, and uh, and I, I don't know they ever caught the people who who shot up the power, the the substation. <laughs> So uh, I don't know whether we are already within the final general discussion. Probably <laughs> we are, or we are not. We can <laughs> slide into. <laughs> well, we can, if we're in the general discussion, yeah, yeah. then we I should sit We can slide down. into into <laughs> that discussion. Uh, so I'd like to first make a, a few qualifications on your very nice uh, 
uh, contribution and maybe make a, a, a more general observation later. First of all, I think one needs to qualify a few things. First of all, in Germany, for example, you have a grid operator, so it's not the state level, or it's not a big country, of course, uh, and people intervene all the time and shut down coal fire power station and uh, sort of connect certain lines, you know, if the wind is blowing in the north. So you can do it, and people told me, I uh, talked to the operators, they more or less can manage so far. Uh. Second thing is, I mean, uh, wind and solar and so on, mm -hmm are highly variable, but they are, not un they are not unpredictable. We have to get this clear. I mean, for example, you can have very good weather forecast already. The temperature forecast is almost exact to one-tenth of a degree now, two days ahead, for example. You can predict wind fields and so on. It's rather a question how you operate the grid. The third qualification is that uh, you showed this nice uh, movie about this uh, major blackout uh, spreading across the United States. Now that heavily depends on the, the nature of the disturbance, of course, huh? and second on the grid topology. So, so we did publish uh, some papers in nature physics and nature communications. If you just change at the right point the grid topology with a few additional transmission lines, you can diffuse these types of disturbances. So if one does yeah. it cleverer. I mean, the general remark I'd like to make, if I may, is that I think uh, one needs to do a systems analysis of the energy grid, of the energy setup, really, in a country or region. So I think it's not just, so I give you just a few dimensions. Eh? It can be high tech, but also low tech. Eh? Low tech may play a role. For example, you can store in a very nice way so, Steve, you can pump water, but you can also use an ice core, for example. So, the phase transition of an ice core, that is being used in yeah. Germany right now for domestic blocks. Sure, yeah, that's so certainly a good... It's, it's low yeah. tech, if you like, but it works pretty well, yeah. actually. You yeah. can combine it with, with high tech, like uh, with wonderful work is done by, by Kuyu, Kuyi and et al. I mean, with the holy grail, uh, the lithium, metal, anode, whatever. The same thing is true with small and large. Yeah? It is true um, with supply and demand. I think we talked a lot about supply, but very little about demand. Yeah? So demand management. Maybe we just do not need to assume that energy demand will just climb and climb and climb yeah? exponentially, whatever. Uh, we may do actually as well with maybe just doubling the energy need in the world by 2100, so that's another. And, and the other thing I think it's, that is very important is uh, fast and slow measures, so to speak. Uh, certain things, we talked about geoengineering a lot of time, and, uh, and, and, and Steve referred to photosynthesis, I think you need to start with certain things immediately, really, which are suboptimal. doesn't matter, because every ton of carbon you can spare, it's fine. Eh? And other things will be in place only in 50 years, but you have to manage all these dimensions at the same time. So I think doing a really holistic view on this complicated uh, cloud of energy systems I think that would be really worthwhile. I haven't seen anything like that. Yeah, well, I absolutely agree that, that we can't afford not to do things right now. And even though we may not know the absolute best thing to do, that shouldn't prevent us from doing what we do know how to do. Among some of the other things, in the US now, the grid certainly has controllers, and there certainly are people who make decisions. And sometimes we've found that the failure of those people to make the right decisions has led to major uh, uh, blackouts, and presumably a smarter grid will allow better decisions to be made that humans aren't really capable of making. It sounds to me like your weather prediction in Germany must be a lot better than ours. <laughs> uh, our people struggle to get within three degrees. Now, albeit that's three degrees Fahrenheit, uh, <laughs> but still, <laughs> for, for the but prediction of what the high temperature is going to be the next day. So, so it sounds like you're doing a lot better than we are. <laughs> With Donald Trump, you will do even better. Yeah. <laughs>